I have gazed upon the face of Agamemnon himself. Welcome, friends, to Intermarian Odyssey. Today, I'd like to take you with us on a journey to Argolida, specifically to the legendary Bronze Age ruins of ancient Mykines, which is often called Mycenae in Western pronunciation. And afterwards, probably we're going to visit beautiful Nafplio as well. Mycenaean civilization is one of the most important phases of ancient Greek history. Linked to and probably related to the more ancient Minoan civilization of Crete, Mycenaean civilization represents both the last period of the Bronze Age in ancient Greece and also the first distinctively Greek Hellotic or mainland Greek civilization who left lasting roots for what would become the Hellenic world. It was, after all, the king of Mykines, among others, that the legend of the Trojan War was connected with in the first place. It's difficult to over-exaggerate the importance of Mycenaean civilization, and thus a single video could never do it justice. But here and in general, my goal isn't to provide you an in-depth historical analysis. That would be disingenuous. I'm not an archaeologist, nor am I specialized in this period. My goal as ever is to pique your interest in the history of these lands and take you on a journey here. So, let's journey to the land from which Jason and the Argonauts set up for Colchis, and more famously, to the city of the king who sacked Troy, or Ilium, in Greek. And if it wasn't for this story, there wouldn't be an Iliad. And if it wasn't for that, there would have never been this story of the legendary Nostos, the Odyssey, back to Greece, back to Ithaca. It would be impossible to talk about Mykines without mentioning Agamemnon, the legendary king of a dark and forgotten age, who's now most popularly recognized by the famous golden mask attributed to him. No, not that one. This one, but more on that later. First, let's talk about our journey. We first set out with our dear friends, a professor who may even feature on this channel later, and my friend Theophilos, who kindly drove us there. We left beautiful Athens early morning and journeyed near the path of the old sacred road that led to Eleusina, after which we head along the winding mountain past, uh, past Megara, and eventually to the Isthmus of Corinth. Uh, the great, long-dreamed-of canal passing the Peloponnese Peninsula and linking the Adriatic and Aegean parts of the Mediterranean Sea, a fast track from Athens to Italy. The canal technically turned the Peloponnese into an island. Here is not Peloponnesus, here is Attica. Here is not Attica, here is Peloponnesus. Though I should add, when we visited the Isthmus this time, the waterway was temporarily blocked due to a rock slide. Glad I wasn't down there. Peloponnesus is a beautiful region of Greece, and I do hope we'll get to go on many journeys there with you. In any case, when we crossed into Peloponnesus, we soon passed uh, besides ancient Corinth, or Corinthos, and her impressive Acropolis, or citadel, uh, honestly, possibly the most impressive in all Greece, second to the Parthenon of, on Athens. The one in um, Corinth is called the Apocorinthos. It was from here where St. Paul preached to the people of Corinth. By the way, a lot of people think the Acropolis is only in Athens, and that may be the case for when we say the Acropolis, the most famous one, and what people are really picturing is the Parthenon on top of the Acropolis. Uh, but in fact, there are many Acropolis throughout ancient Greece, as this simply means a fortified place above a city, literally just means above a city. Acro, above, and polis, meaning the city. So essentially, it's a citadel. Many cities in Greece have them, and technically Mykines itself is one, as it's the essential Bronze Age Greek citadel. The same, by the way, this concept is true about East Slavs when speaking about Kremlins, which once again are citadels, uh, and there are many, many more, and more ancient ones, by the way, than the one in Moscow, or I suppose ancient, I should say older, as uh, Moscovia didn't exist in the ancient period, despite the use of the term Drevni or Drevnaya. So anyways... After passing Corinth, it was not long until we were in the ancient uh, lands of Argolis, or as it's called in modern Greek, Argolida, that beautiful land of myth and song. And citrus groves. The best citrus groves. All the citrus groves. And here, in the Vale of Argolida, did we come upon ancient Mykines. What is amazing to me about Mykines in the early modern period is actually the fact that it was lost. Yes, we lost an ancient city, one of the most important in all Greece. A lost part of our heritage. Well, not really. You don't stumble upon your heritage. It's there, just waiting to be explored and shared. It was always there, you see, amidst the rocks, just waiting to be found. Its memory had simply been forgotten. 
But there was a small village located not far from it, and in general, this was not a sparsely inhabited region, with Argos, the great city nearby and in sight, and overall it was not far from what was to be the capital of modern Greece, Nafplio. It seems, over time, well, thousands of years, it had just left the common memory. After all, without education, printing press, much less the internet, it was hard to keep track of what was there. Maybe in oral legend it was preserved that there was an important ancient castle nearby. Maybe the children of shepherds even climbed into the mountains and played over the rocks with no clues to what they were standing on. But it wasn't until later archaeologists took note of the ruins that they discovered it was indeed Mykines, specifically identifying it based on Parsonius' ancient description of the Lion's Gate. The origin of the iconic Lion's Gate is still really a mystery. I even think it has Babylonian features. In any case, upon later excavations, German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann discovered a real wonder hidden in burial mound A, the golden mask of an ancient king, a face from the past. No, not that one. This one. And when he saw it, he spoke the famous words which he sent in a telegram to the king of Greece. I have gazed upon the face of Agamemnon. Agamemnon was the ancient king of Mykines in Homer's immortal story of the Trojan War, in the Iliad. It was he who led the Greek invasion force which sacked Troy or Ilium. He was the brother of the king of Sparta, Menelaus, who also played an important role. But what started the Trojan War? Well, like many interesting stories, probably all really interesting stories, it started with a girl, specifically the most beautiful girl in the world, Helen of Troy. She was, um, promised to a young prince of Troy. Uh, there was just one little problem, you see. She just so happened to be the... The most beautiful woman from Sparta Her name was Helen Wife of the king Manalaeus Oh, Trojan War You should definitely listen to that full song by history teachers, by the way. They're awesome. Well... Unfortunately, we won't get to go over the full story here, as that video would be way too long, and it really is worth its own separate video. But in short, turns out the king of Sparta did not appreciate his wife being stolen by the Trojans, and, well, to say the least... The Greeks were mad, they gathered all the ships they had, but then the fleet just wouldn't move, Swagamen he could do. Agamemnon sacrificed his own daughter to appease Artemis. Yeah, he wasn't really a nice guy. But in any case, as the legend goes, then the fleet would set sail to sack Troy. And Helen became immortalized as the face that launched a thousand ships. By the way, somewhat off the main road, closer to the Isthmus of Corinth on the sea road, there's a small village called, I believe, Lutra Aurea Seleni, uh, or the, uh, should be the font, or perhaps the spring of Helen the Beautiful, where she was said to have lived and or bathed. As to the para-historicity of these events, or Agamemnon himself, well, we can't really address it now, but what we can do is explore the ancient realm of Agamemnon, and we'll chat about this in a later video, I hope. So, let's walk through the Lion's Gate. Not that lion. Now we can do a brief walk through the museum. So we're finally where I've been wanting to show you. This is, of course, ancient Mykines, where Agamemnon lived. In ancient times, of course, of the fame of the Iliad and Odyssey, he was the king of Mykines. Mykines was the capital of Mycenaean or Mycenaean in Greek civilization. So capital of ancient Mycenaean civilization, very important for our culture. In general, I will put more facts later because I'm quite tired. We've only been here, I would say, for about a week now. Of course, I mean, I've been to Mykines before, it's just all of this to move back, in some senses home, but in some senses to a new place, is an interesting feeling, to say the least. In summer there are way more people, I forget what the price is in summer, in the winter usually you pay about 6 euros for a ticket. And here is of course the famous Lion's Gate, which we will see in more detail up ahead. And that's already the Bay of Argolida. And in the distance, you can see the Apargos. Argos, of course, being the oldest continually inhabited city in Europe. And the region around Argos is called Argolida. And here we are. 
They say they're Babylonian or otherwise from Persia. That's so that's from the back side. And now we play the fun game of can I talk and climb stairs at the same time without tripping? It's always fun. And of course I'm also wearing the wrong shoes. This reminds me of, I think it's called Austin Entelil or something like that in Tolkien's writings. I'll have to look up the actual right way to say it because I'm sure I butchered it. But I think they were what, Sindarin elves or they were like the people of Celebrimbor and where the rings were forged. Sauron deceived the elves into, but their great home was something like that. Austin Entelil or Austin Endelil. If I remember, Celebrimbor was the, I think, grandson of Fëanor, who was like the greatest smith in Tolkien's legends, and he also, of course, had a habit for making, <laughs> suffice to say, objects of great doom in the classical sense of great judgment and woe, which I think fits the theme of Greek tragedy well. But yeah, this just reminds me of that, at least how it's depicted in the film The Lord of the Rings in New Zealand. Sort of ruins up there. It was written something along the lines of, hi, they raised me, something else, and they're gone. I'll have to put it on the screen because it's really cool. I always loved that. But yeah, Mykines is a special place just due to its antiquity. Really one of the most important archeological sites in Greece. Of course, there's also Delphi, which we must go to. I mean, again, I've been there before, but sadly, this was before I decided to film this, and I'm so happy that we came. This was also a very last-minute thing, because I really wanted to go to Thessaloniki to see a good friend of mine, but Thessaloniki did not happen, and so instead, we came to Argolida and to Mykines. So, it's all good. You can see, of course, the sea from here. It's just beautiful. Something tells me this was not ancient. Now what's really interesting to me is just this, to think where we're standing now, and we'll see more, but I always ask myself, who and at what time people were living here. If you think about it like this, at one point this was a settlement. Mykines, of course, like we were saying, being one of the oldest in Peloponnes. So in, in Peloponnesus. And so, uh, so people were at one time, and I just asked myself, one of the most interesting things for me is just wondering, being that Mykines is one of the most oldest sites in uh, Peloponnesus and in Greece in general, looking over these ruins and wondering, you know, of this palace or of this home. I mean, who was living here? And I don't mean by that Agamemnon and all of that. I, I mean, in the most simplest sense, was somebody at one point sitting or right over there and drinking wine or even just water and maybe eating some local plant that 
course, I hear certain type breeds of citrus are even modern. Like I think they say lemons or whatnot was invented. So anyways, were they just sitting here? Were people just sitting here and eating and talking and looking out over these same mountains? I mean, the road has changed. The houses down there have definitely changed. Those are by no means ancient houses. But the mountains, those haven't changed. And certainly not only so many times the Aparvos and that territory. So I just wonder how, how many people, simple people, not even kings and the sort that usually make it into storybooks, but how many servants in this house were just sitting here looking out over the hill? I always wonder these things. This area always gives me Lord of the Rings vibes for some reason. Tolkien vibes. A more rocky Rivendell maybe, but in ruins. Or even in a more depressing sense, something like, well, like we were saying, Austin ended when all the elves were gone finally and all that's left is their ruins. We know once there was a great civilization here, but at some point, all things returned to the earth. For me, the even more impressive thing and amazing and confounding thing is that, you know, the location of Mykines was lost at one point. Now, what do we mean by lost? Of course, these stones didn't just disappear, but it was forgotten about. I mean, after the destruction of the Roman Empire, you know, well, I mean, way before that, different Greek civilizations existed and passed, but it, it was lost from memory after the fall of Rome and the sort of the the period we call Turkokratia, the rule of the Turks. Uh, it was civilizationally speaking a, a bit of a downgrade. I mean in, in general uh, all of that medieval period in some ways we can view as a downgrade compared to the you know the wisdom of the ancient period in some ways. Uh, and so they had just forgotten the history and forgotten the records. It was lost what this was. I'm sure they would have seen a fortress up here, but they would have just said, oh, Castrum, probably in the medieval times, you know, an old, an old castle or something. And the inhabitants who lived here were probably looking at it, and they probably had their own made-up legends about it, but many didn't even know that this was the site of, well, Mykines and where Agamemnon was from and all of that. So it's amazing to me how that can happen. Like, how can you lose, on the one hand, a piece of your history, yet it'd be right there in plain sight all along. It was right here, just nestled up on top of the mountains, and plain view of Greek settlement down in, you know, modern Greek or early modern Greek settlement down in the valley, and yet somehow it was lost and rediscovered. I guess you never really lose your heritage, it's always there, waiting to be rediscovered, if we take care of it though, that is. So now we're going to go down there, and we'll look at some more interesting things. I cannot decide, I think that might be a drone, I don't know if you can see it. It's climbing. I can't see it in the video, I can only see it with my eyes. There's the museum, which we will go to in a moment. I just want to reach the end with you guys. Who was living here at one time? Now, what is this? Let's see if I can climb it without making a fool of myself. Always an option, by the way. Never doubt my ability to screw up. I'm good at that. I think it just leads out into the wilderness. This could have been, though, I'm by no means an expert on um, ancient archaeology or architecture, but there is a concept in fortifications called a prostern gate, which in theory would be something like this, which was a small gate, not a large one like the lion's gate, but a small gate to a fortress that allowed, you know, a few people to pass through, small group of supplies, um, and in general they were not dangerous, they were not really seen as structural weaknesses because they'd be very easy to block. I mean, if you just had a very massive rock, you could just drop it in front or you could just barricade it in such a way that no one could really get through. There wasn't, and, and even if it was open, I mean, it would be such a, a sort of a kill zone that it wasn't considered dangerous to the defenders of a fortress to have a small entrance. I mean, even smaller than this one, to be honest, and I can't say for sure if that's what this was or not, but I just thought it's interesting to point out that 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 was an important resource and aspect of fortifications and that form of architecture. So now we're going to try to go down here and let's see what we find. First we'll go here. Now we attempt something somewhat 
homicidal, which I may or may not do. And we're going to try to walk down here, but given my balance, that might not be so good idea. But we will try. So it's locked. Quick way into the museum. I don't know how much we're going to look at today. But we'll take a quick peek. Honestly, the museum isn't that impressive. It's the, the ruins that really you want to look at. Uh, the best museum in Greece, at least for ancient things, is of course the National Archaeological Museum. And actually the Byzantine Christian Museum is very good for, you know, that period. But for now, we are just going to go in. We're going to look at what they got. So, here we are. We have a nice model of Mykines. I don't know if this helps anyone or not, but there it is. Let's see if real quick before someone else comes we can look at the Lion's Gate where we were. And actually, in surprisingly uh, acceptable detail, there's the Lion's Gate. Alright. So this is just in general about Mycenaean or Mykenian civilization and a sword. I will put it here and slowly show you. And if you want, you can pause the video and read. Famedo. What is this? Let's go down. Ah, oh, this is the famous treasury room where... And maybe finally here we'll get to see the famous ancient golden mask. Not that one! This one! I, uh really need to pay my editor more. Unfortunately, the original is not here. This is a replica, but maybe in a later video we can visit the place where it's kept. As to its historicity, I'll say this now. Again, I am not an expert on this period, but the general consensus is the mask is indeed unquestionably genuine. Uh, it is an artifact of the Bronze Age, but it probably dates to before the events of the Trojan War, or at least their classical date. But for me, that only increases its legend. Coins from different time periods. Now this is what's always interesting to people, the women of Mykines. They look like the very similar to Minoan women, of course there was a relation, obviously. The style is very distinctive. You had the whole concept of the orientalizing period. Ah, now this is important. This is about the trade. Really, all the great ancient civilizations were based on waterways because they were trading peoples. And I find even today, the best people, the most educated people, the most enlightened people, the most liberal people, really, they're always people who are prone to trade and cultural exchange. And you see that's the case, whether we're talking about ancient Egyptian civilization, even ancient, um, well, before them, Sumerians, if we're talking about uh, the Phoenician civilization, ancient Hellenic civilization, Romans, and of course later the British Empire and the Dutch, and the, they were all trading peoples. And so it, this is why also their languages in each of their time periods was the lingua franca of the time. First, we can say uh, in the Hellenistic period, Greek became, well, then it became uh, Latin. And of course we have English, very influential. So. Yes, I always find in, in any city, it's the same effect, any port city is always one of the most best and I find progressive places in any country. If you've seen our Piraeus, you would maybe, well, that's a story for another day. Beautiful city though.
we really need to get going, but is it wet down there? No. Okay, let's quickly show you this. All right, so here we are. We'll go in real quick. I always remembered going into these. It makes such a sound when you're inside, such an echo. I don't know if it'll do it now. It looks like it's a little bit wet and I do want to avoid the mud. But yeah, you can, I don't know if you can already hear, but my voice is already echoing. And by the center, it's a complete reverberation around all the walls and I'm pretty sure anyone standing above me can hear everything I'm saying. Kind of a cool effect. Yeah, even if you stomp your feet, you will hear. Nice. And now we've gazed upon the tomb of Agamemnon. Well, not really, but... Well, if the other echoed, then this one should really echo. Definitely. Mykines fell in the famous Bronze Age Collapse, a mysterious event in which, not just there, but all across the world, great Bronze Age civilizations, well, you guessed it, collapsed. And we really don't know exactly why. But this collapse ends the Bronze Age period of ancient Greek history. And what follows it were the Greek Dark Ages. The ages are called dark, I should add, not because they were so grim, but because the lack of sources about them, as Greeks seemingly had lost their writing system, the Linear B of Mykines. But you see, it's with the end of this period that the Archaic Age of Ancient Greece begins, when this simulated contact with their Phoenician brothers and sisters, another great seafaring people from what is today Lebanon, whose descendants would later be Hellenized, that the Greeks formed their ancient alphabet on the basis of the Phoenician. And from this, Homer already wrote his Iliad and his Odyssey, and so you see, it seems that the figures of ancient Mykidian civilization, whatever passed down either by oral or lost written records, were preserved in the memory of ancient Hellenic peoples and passed into song and legend, which the great Homer conveys to us. And when you trace back these roots, the roots of all ancient civilizations, you'll eventually see that we're all really related in a sense. This great civilizational journey, this odyssey, this belongs to all of us. It wasn't invented by Homer. He simply passed the torch down to us, as we hopefully will do for future generations. I hope you enjoyed Mykines, ancient Mycenaean civilization, and this format in general. And I would really appreciate it if you left comments either way uh, about what you'd like to see more of, or what you liked, or even what you didn't like. But in any case, let's continue our odyssey to Nafplio. Thanks for watching.